And it's a pleasure to have you on this morning. And there's a lot to cover. I normally do this demo in like an hour, hour and a half. So I'm going to try and just condense some key parts into the next 20 minutes or so. Uh, just briefly, I'll touch on the architecture because it's, it's, it's really important to understand how this all fits together. So Prisma Access is a one-stop shop solution. And what I mean by that is that it can combine both secure web services and private access services in one solution under one management tool. And that's important to know because a lot of our competition, they will offer things like secure web gateway, they'll offer private access, but often the different architectures, they're managed on different dashboards and so forth. This really does combine it and brings it all together in one nice, easy fit. So there's, there's various, oh, don't click, I just want to point. The various entry points into Prisma Access, there's unmanaged, there's mobile users and remote networks. We're going to concentrate on mobile users today because that is the most prevalent use case that we're obviously seeing at the moment. And that really is due to COVID and the pandemic. <clears throat> Back in February, March, you know, I was sort of doing, doing lots of work on, on general business and, and the floodgates just opened up because all of a sudden customers were coming to us saying, oh my word, we had 20, 25% of our workforce mobile at any one point in time. Now we've got hundred percent of them mobile and it's stretching our resources. It's stretching our VPN gateways that are on premise. Uh, it's impacting on our ISP bandwidth because we're consuming more than we, than we ever anticipated. And we've got this bottleneck and it's causing us pain. Prisma Access is built in the cloud. It's, it was it's strategically been built in the cloud, natively built there, initially in AWS, but now on GCP, which means we've got 100 plus locations globally where we can spin up and instantiate a security node that your end users can connect into. So the mobile user can have a, will have an agent on it that can be for Windows, Mac, Linux, um, Android, iOS, all kinds of manner of OS. We're going to concentrate on Windows today. And they connect into Prisma Access to the nearest location using IPsec, or they can fall back to something like SSL VPN. We've also got remote networks connectivity, which is your traditional sort of fixed lines, IPsec tunnels from a CPE back into Prisma Access. Uh, that can be any CPE that can run an IPsec tunnel, SD-WAN, we've got multiple SD-WAN providers that we integrate with, including our own, with our, our recent acquisition of CloudGenix. And we've got these connections into your data centers that we actually call internally service connections because they're providing connectivity into your internal services, your private apps and your workloads, be they in public or in a private data center, bricks and mortar data center. <clears throat> it's IPsec, so we need to build an IPsec tunnel into these environments. That could be on any next gen firewall or, you know, flavor firewall it doesn't have to be a Palo Alto Networks IPsec termination point or it could even be in public cloud and native virtual gateway that can deliver IPsec. The intention there is this is a fully routed network. We've got BGP running here. We can do static and BGP to your, to your, to your remote branches. Um, mobile users get an IP address from a pool that you allocate from Prisma Access, but mobile user could talk to mobile user. Mobile user can talk to a, a branch if need be. Branch can talk to branch. Branch can talk back to your data center. It really does give you the flexibility and basically gives your end users the experience of that they're on they're on the network. They're, they're not at home, but like the majority of them are, or even in a hotel when eventually we get to fly again. They feel, it looks and feels like they're actually in the office. All fully inspected. Um, we've got stream-based panelist architecture here. It's not a proxy, so there's certain things that you don't have to whitelist or allow list because proxies break certain applications. We can look at all ports, all protocols, and we can provide that zero touch or zero trust architecture, I should say, where everything in egress is inspected and everything leaving via the egress is inspected, be it going to the internet services, to your sanctioned SaaS apps or so forth, or back into your private data center. And one of the key differentiators that I'm gonna show here is, is that many of the, the sort of the security defined perimeter the SDP uh, providers, uh, some of the providers are providing sort of outbound services. When I mean outbound, it's, it's outbound from the mobile user inbound, is that they can't provide that bi-directional private to private traffic. It really is client to server. It can't be server back to client. So in the interest of time, let me just come out of that and go into Panorama. 
So Panorama is the centralized management tool um, for everything network security for, for Palata Networks. So you can manage next gen firewalls on this, you can manage your VM series, create all the policy for them. You basically put them into groups or device groups. You might have perimeter firewalls, you might have internal based firewalls, but you've also got Prisma access device groups as well. And these policies are all defined in here. So you've got a mobile user device group, which is my Prisma access for mobile users, my policy for remote network, for my, my remote network branches, but all the policies are placed in here. <clears throat> and what that means is, is that as I spin up a gateway in Prisma access, depending on what device group I've created it in, it will attach all these rules to that security node in the cloud. So it means that I can deploy to many in minutes and I can have that consistent security policy, whether I'm in uh, Sydney, where I'm in uh, New Zealand, in Auckland, or whether I'm in Dallas, London, wherever it, it, whatever it might be, wherever your, your footprint is. So I'll introduce you to this endpoint here. This is um, one of my end users. He's on a Windows machine, he's Joe. He's actually not logged in at the moment. He's in pre-logon mode. And, and John touched on this briefly in his introduction. Many of the customers that I'm speaking with are worried about the concept of, of when do they turn the VPN on? When do they turn it off? The security gap that is obviously introduced when maybe they're working from home and their VPN's not on and then they come back to the office eventually or they turn it back on. What kinds of threats are they introducing into the environment by not having an always on capability? Well, I'm just gonna time out on the screen. You can see here, and this is cosmetic, you can actually turn all these, all these knobs and buttons off, but I'm showing you here that this endpoint is actually connected to Prisma Access, but Jai hasn't actually logged in. <clears throat> now, if I go back to my panorama screen, I'm going to the monitor tab and look at mobile users. This is the map of the world. I've only got two sites that are actually, or service locations lit up at the moment. Um, my AC tenant only gives me access to two. They won't give me access to all 100, but I've got Singapore turned on and I've got one in Australia, New Zealand turned on. And that's actually Australia South, which is uh, our entry point down in, in Melbourne. And the current user, I can actually look at this device and see that there is a Windows machine connected via pre-logon. I know the computer name, Obviously you can map computer names back to the end users uh, when you've got that in your CRMs or whatever, but it's got a private IP address. It's actually pulled from the IP address pool in Prisma Access. And I can see what time it logged in and what its IP address is, <clears throat> but the end user actually isn't connected in yet. Now, if I go to uh, like our data center, but this could be someone working from home as well. I'm just, I'm just going to a server that I've already peed into. And I can actually, if I look at the IP address of that endpoint, where has it gone? Let's just click in here. What was your 172 summit? 3117.5. So I can actually ping that machine. So I'm in the data center, I could be in the corporate or home office, I could be at home, but I can actually ping that device. And, and just to confirm that as well, say I was an IT admin and we, and we get this a lot with contact centers or customers saying, well, what if my contact agent's working from home, but he needs to RDP or connect into a session for an end user that's got a problem from an IT perspective. I can actually connect into that if I put the right IP address in. <laughs> Live, I love it. <laughs> and you can see it's given me a, a prompt to log in. If I can remember my password, say yes to the certificates and everything. Uh, and I'm actually connecting back into that endpoint that I showed you, JPledge's endpoint as the uh, as the test ADA user. <clears throat> See full blown 4K on this particular endpoint that I'm logging into, it's like massive, but I've got glasses on and so is John, so that's not a bad thing. And I can go to like the command prompt again, and I could, for an example, just to show you bi-directional, do a, um, ping back to the actual server that I'm connecting up. And I'll be able to, I should have done a resolution for that as well. Things like DNS, a part and parcel of this solution. 16, sorry, typo. You can see I'm actually resolving that server IP as well to its um, local domain name. So internal domains covered, we can do external domains obviously because we're gonna go and show you stuff on the internet. 
But um, just to show you that I've got bi-directional connectivity from a server to a client and a client to a server. And don't underestimate that a lot of the new providers out there that are trying to replace your traditional VPN can't provide that particular service. So while I'm logging out of that, take a little while. Let's go back into this plugin. So <clears throat> there's a status panel here, which resembles very much the, the diagram I showed you earlier. Service, the, the actual service connections are these entry points, like I mentioned, into data, into the private or public data centers. Um, I've just got one set up in my particular tenancy at the moment. So it's showing that that tunnel is up, so it's green. The config status is telling me that I'm fully synced with Prisma Access in the cloud from a panorama perspective. And I've got one service connection. Um, remote networks, I've actually got three tunnels actually created. Two are up, one is down, which is why I've got an error status. But this is giving me like a 30,000 foot view of what's going on in the environment. And my mobile users uh, status is okay, my gateways are okay, my config is synced. Um, it's telling me how many current users I've actually got logged in and what that count for the current users was over a 90 day period. And the Cortex data lake is actually a logging service. So um, all, the, all the logs that we generate in all the sessions, be they mobile users, remote branches, so traffic logs, threat log, URL filtering logs, all those are actually uh, natively put in the data lake. They're not, they're not coming to Panorama. Panorama is querying them from the data lake, but all this is going to a central repository up in the cloud that's hosted and managed by Palo Alto Networks, your own tenant, different encryption keys from other customers. We can't actually get into that data. It's really, really um, um, secure. Uh, let's go back to Joe. So the sound is disconnected because I had an RDP session going in. Um, like I said, this is cosmetic. You could just have this file up in the background and not have Joe see it. You can even have the option to Joe not even press connect. It can all just be done seamlessly in the background, but just to show you what it looks like. And I'm going to log in, Joe. I'm in my password again. <clears throat> and the authentication I'm using here is actually Active Directory for this particular demo. But we do support SAML 2.0, Kerberos, TACAX, um, uh, Azure AD for SAML as an, as an example that a lot of people are using, um, multi-factor environments like Okta and so on. So I'm logging in. It'll take a little while, but this will actually load in. I will not connect into Prisma Access at all. The pre-login will kick in, the actual login that I've set up with the Active Directory is kicking in because we've pre-built Joe prior to him actually leaving home or whatever, we can actually have him connecting into Global Protect, which is the agent on the endpoint into Prisma Access seamlessly. So we just let the system tray kick in there and you can see we've got this little world icon that's saying connected and that's the Global Protect agent. Now the gateways I've got available are Australia South on Sing and Singapore. Those are the ones I showed you on that status map. They're the only two I've got lit up. So they're the only two options for the uh, end user. You could have a whole list for the customer to be able to connect into if, they, if you want to give them the option to pick, or you could just have best available showing, which means that they will connect to their nearest gateway. And there's an algorithm that we run that actually determines where they connect into. So there's two aspects to this. There's one called the portal, which you connect into. Uh, and then the portal actually publishes all the gateways that were available to the end user. And then the algorithm will kick in and point them to where they need to go. So let me just show you that quickly in the Panorama config setup. Uh, service setup, I haven't touched on that. This is the infrastructure that we build all the cloud firewalls on. We ask for an IP address scheme from the customer. It can be any IP address schema, but generally we use private IP addressing, but one that doesn't conflict with your existing WAN because it's a fully routed network, like I said. So it's really important for that. This area also shows you the Panorama revision that you're working on, what actual Global Protect app or agent you've actually deployed to your end users and if you want to upgrade you can just click here and if you've given them permissions when they log in you might get a pop-up saying do you want to download the latest and they can or you can just push it out silently through SCC, SCCM um, and other tools that you can do automation with and the current data plane version of Prisma Access. Customers ask for this they like to know what PanOS revision they're actually running as a cloud service we've made that available to the customers. Hopefully in the previous session, you learned that the data plane 
on a per tenant basis is dedicated to you as a customer. We're not sharing that data plane, which means you're not sharing bandwidth. And more importantly, you're not sharing the egress IPs that you're using to go out to those network services like SaaS and so on. We've often seen where other uh, competitions share their IP address pools for the public IP netting that, you know, if someone has a bad day and they blacklist that pool of subnets, then multiple customers get blacklisted and they can't access their services like Salesforce and 365 and whatever. So that can be really painful. So everything is dedicated to you as a tenant. On the mobile user side, when you set things up, there's, there's two concepts. You've only got two zones. We've almost, we've got a trusted zone and an untrusted zone. But you can create tags or I sort of call them child zones, but they can only fall into one of two buckets, untrusted or trusted. And the reason you can create different ones is that you might want to use those tags when you're creating your security policy. So for example, here in the trusted zone, I've got like a mobile user private, I've just got a generic trust and I've got a data center one. When I go into my policy and I go into my mobile user device group, which is where the Prisma Access mobile users are, it makes use then, because when I'm doing things like uh, source zones and the drop down, I can pick one of those tags. They're going to fall into the trust zone, the explicit trust zone, but it means that for the likes of monitoring, logging, reporting, and so on, it makes it a lot cleaner and easier to know that when that rule was hit, the source address or source user was coming from the data center or a branch site, whatever it might be. Um, Okay, um, go back to the setup on the mobile users. Locations, so there's a map of the world. Um, when you're on Prisma or Access on Panorama via the UI, you can literally select where you want to instantiate a cloud firewall. It is that simple. So I've got South lit up, but obviously you've got South, East and East on the Eastern Seaboard here in Australia, and we've got one in New Zealand. You just click on it. My license is oversubscribed, so I can't do that, but that would just say click OK. I'll click OK again. And then I would just come up to here and click Commit and Push. And that would actually then send an IPA call out via our gateways to Prisma Access to say, fire up a new security node in New Zealand. And it's all scripted. You don't have to do any of that um, scripting. We've done it for you. It's a service. And generally, security nodes take about 15 minutes or so to stand up in the cloud get all the security policies attached to them dynamically and then away you go. So really powerful if you're a global organization and obviously you want to light up certain areas or even if you've got mobile users that maybe are just going to a conference in North America for a couple of weeks, you can spin up a gateway there, let the users connect to the nearest gateway, obviously consume all their SaaS service and everything more locally rather than hairpinning back to Australia and then you can turn it back off again. It really gives you that scalability and flexibility uh, to do that. the time so the global protect agent this is on windows um, if i look in the settings there's a disable button here you can actually hide that so that your end users could never disable but i've got it enabled there just so you can see it and in here you can just see the portal that i'm connected to uh, the actual username uh, the connection so it's external i'm connected to our melbourne one what my ip allocation is my gateway ip that i'm connecting to all that correlates back to again panorama where in the IP pools that you select, um, you create pools of addresses for your users to connect into. Uh, and the beauty with the subscription of this is that is that it's not a subscription on a per it's a subscription on a per user basis, not a per device basis. So if John Evans wants to log in with you know with his mobile phone and then with his Mac and then with his Windows machine, um, an Android tablet or whatever it is, there might be four connections, but that's actually one license because it's attached, it's attached to John Evans, the end user, not to the device. And then we can select, you know, what regions do we want regional IP addressing? Do we want a overarching worldwide IP pool addressing scheme? But that's where the IP address gets attached to the agent so they can connect in and get inbound connections into Prisma Access from a private app perspective and a, and a public cloud or internet services perspective. Um, so let's go back into here. <clears throat> So general use case, like I said, I've pinged into the private data center. I showed you that a second ago. If, I, if I'm just doing general things like browsing, everything you would expect from a security solution is there. We do URL filtering, uh, we do threat prevention. Uh, we've got a thing called wildfire, which is part of the service, which is our cloud sandbox, which means if there's any, any zero, trust, zero trust, any zero day or unknown 
potential malware that we've we've seen go through the firewall in Prisma Access, that will get sent, sent up to be analyzed by a sandbox and come back with a verdict of benign or bad. If bad, we'll write new signatures on the fly and push that down to all those security nodes that you've seen in Prisma Access. So I've got a couple of test scripts here, uh, just for shortcuts. Just, just to show you the kind of things that you would see from a user experience, I've just tried to click on something to download. I might be unaware as an end user that's got some malware in it, but the pop-up will come up. So it will tell you there's a virus or spyware download blocked. I'll give you the reasons it's company policy. And you can, this is tailored. You can see I've created this for Enablist just this morning. And obviously, like anything that might go wrong, you just contact John Evans. That's always the way you contact John on 1300. Don't panic. Um, he's not an engineer, but he'll try his best. Um, other things that you can see on here, that was virus downloads. Uh, if I do something like, you know, a malware download, for example, again, we can block that page, but more importantly, you know, I'll tell you what the user is, what the URL was, and what category we actually blocked on, which was malware in this instance. Um, other things to show you. Uh, Phishing, different categories, all via the uh, the engine. So if I go into objects here, we've got security profiles for antivirus, anti spyware, URL filtering profiles, where we see you can you can create one. You've got all the different categories here, and we can determine if we want to alert on them, block on them, do things like continue button, which means you know someone might go to a website and a continue pop up comes up saying. You're not really supposed to be going to this kind of website. If you click continue, we'll let you go through. Or even things like override, which means that someone's actually got to put a password in. We use that a lot with our threat research team. If they're going into the dark web and they're looking for stuff, sometimes they have to click continue, or, sorry, click override and put a password in to go and do their research. But obviously that's logged so we can track that. Um, going back to the end user again. One often thing that comes up and just shout anyone if I'm running out of time, um, is, is things like credential theft or credential phishing. So I'm gonna go to actually what's one of my Panorama test sites. It's got no certificate, but I could block that because it hasn't got a certificate if I wanted to. I've left this in, this, this pop-up doesn't appear for your end users, you can have this removed, but this is just showing that I'm actually doing some SSL inspection. So yes, I wanna proceed. You could have that pop-up for end users if it doesn't need to. And I'm going to put in um, the credentials from my Active Directory. And it's actually saying, oh, hold on a moment. You're actually trying to use corporate credentials to go to an unknown site. We want to stop that because you could have been fished. Maybe someone's trying to get you to go to a phishing link, put in your corporate username and password credentials, which they can then harvest and then potentially use as part of an attack. So you can have things like this pop up. This is unique to Power to Networks as well. There's no one else doing credential phishing um, in this environment. John, I can see your head popping up. Is there questions coming in? Oh, I can't hear you. You're on, you're on mute. No, nothing in, nothing in the chat yet. We'll, we'll probably right. open it. If, if you've got a, uh, five or so more minutes, then we can maybe open it up to the, the participants to just uh, ask some questions. Yeah. An interesting one that comes up is around um, securing things like 0365 tenants. We've got many customers that are saying, you know, well, we've got our own corporate tenant for 365. If someone visits our office or, or they're trying to log into their own, own Gmail account or their own 365 account, can we block that or put restrictions around it? Uh, the answer to that is, is a yes. Just trying to think of one that I can log in with, probably the one that I had there. And a chunk. There's a password there, really secure, but I change it all the time anyway. So even if this is recorded, it doesn't matter. So I'm trying to sign into an account that actually we've said is not allowed. So you can see I've got, you can't get in here from here. Um, there's a thing called HTTP header insertion where we can stipulate what tenant names for 365 you can access. So it's not just a blanket, anyone can log into 365. We can be quite prescriptive on how we do that. So that's why you've got that pop up there. And then if I if I do it with um, another account, this is our actual corporate account. Uh, Hi, Nick. 
We Hello. just had one question from Jonathan asking, does Palo Alto's solution work in China? Ah, good question. So China's a complex one because of, well, government. It's, it's not a technical argument. This is all about bureaucracy. This is all about red tape and the fact that, you know, it's a communist regime and everything else. But we actually haven't got Prisma access gateways natively in China today. Um, I know some of our competition have got their gateways in there. They've put them in data centers to be able to service that. But because we're doing it in public cloud, we actually haven't had to be able to do that because we haven't got Google, for example, that we partner with to go and deliver it there. We've been in discussion with the likes of Alibaba because the one thing about China is, is that we actually, we can't actually manage it ourselves. We'd have to get a third party that's within China to manage that for us. So that's complex. We've talked to people like Alibaba, but we've actually got a hybrid environment that we touch on or, or talk to customers around that, which is um, we've got, for example, one of the universities that a lot, a lot of Chinese students that can't fly in to Queensland, as an example, they wanted to use uh, Prisma Access and get through the Great Wall. So we actually built a VM series fire with an Alibaba by connecting to there as their gateway. And we actually use their private network through to Hong Kong to break out into Prisma Access. And that's, that's working because it seems to be circumventing, circumventing the, the great firewall. So they're getting some quite predictable performance. And it also then opens them up to connect to the rest of the world. So that's the sort of approach we've got around China. And we've actually got a white paper on it that I can, I can share so you can read that in further detail. Great, thanks. I'd be keen to read that. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, yeah, more Q&A. Were you, Nick, were you just finishing off on, was there something you were just going down there? Was that the end of that piece? Was it? Uh, yeah, I was going to try and log in with my corporate account, but I'm not sure where I set up the rules. Let me double check. I might pose another question in the live. Go for it. Um, so we, we use SD-WAN heavily. Um, yeah. Can is is there a way that the you know the SD WAN can work in a hybrid with with SASE in terms of people connecting to the edge gateway, um, and then still yeah, utilize the, the routing yeah. pass and stuff in our SD WAN? Yep. So I was going to try and show you a diagram. So with SD WAN. Typically, SD-WAN providers don't provide a really good security service. So with Prisma Access, we can sort of act as an overlay on top of that. So we often see like SD-WAN overlay. Most customers are going to try and push their traffic over the SD-WAN fabric, and they still want some security going up onto the internet cloud. So let me just anonymize this picture a little bit. And I can show you this. You can see I'm, I'm blocking my own um, traffic here, John. So I've just got to sort that out. Um, picture of this. Can everyone see that? Not yet, I don't believe. We've got your... You got the diagram? No, I've got your login no. screen. It's a bit laggy at the moment. Yeah, no, it, is. it always lags. I'll just give it a bit of time. Still got panorama showing. Yeah. Oh. Hold on. It's all right. Let me try again. Hopefully you can see a screenshot at some point. It's trying to come up. <laughs> is it really that slow wow mm. goodness me here we go there you go it's gone yeah you got a diagram yeah so uh the scene is quite common this is actually a proof of concept i'm doing at the moment so um they've got they've got an sd-wan i think they're using might be viptel or cisco isr because it's all becoming cisco isr at the moment but what they're trying to do is obviously keep all their private traffic 
on the SD WAN fabric. And then they're building an IPsec tunnel, either on the same WAN, internet WAN link, because I might have just one direct internet access link or maybe multiple, it depends how they want to do it. That's the SD WAN provider's decision or, or the customer. But then they push a tunnel up to Prisma Access. So private traffic stays on the fabric. So branch to branch, either the telephony or whatever it might be, going up to the data center services, stays on the on the fabric. But then default traffic or anything like that goes up the IPsec tunnel hits the security node in Prisma Access and goes through all the inspection that you'd expect from Palo Alto Networks on route to internet or SaaS services. So that we see that quite often uh, as an option. Some customers are also saying, well, we won't do direct internet from branch. We still want to regionalize it. And they might have like an SD-WAN gateway in the data center. And then you could break out to Prisma Access from that as well. So there's, there's, different, there's different ways you can do it with SD-WAN. Does this, does this make, you know, services like Cisco Umbrella and whatnot uh, redundant? Of course it does. They're one of my competition. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Because we've got DNS. I mean, the thing about Cisco Umbrella is it's, it was like Open DNS, really. Well, they acquired Open DNS and turned it into a service. Uh, we can do DNS security as well. We can look at DNS tunneling, for example. Some uh, malicious actors try and use port 53 and dns to go and, and do nefarious acts and even browse things like the internet through port 53 rather than port 80 uh, because we're all ports all protocols and looking at the application we can say well we know it's dns and we know if it's port 53 or not we can still stop it we can look into the tunneling as well um, our dns service as well isn't re isn't reliant on DNS services. So Cisco will say you need to use your these particular DNS services because that's the way they can direct the traffic through their DNS system and do their inspection on it. Well, for us, we don't we don't care whether you use Google's DNS, you use uh, Telstra's DNS, uh, because we're in line, we're going to do that full inspection anyway. But absolutely, um, the market is you know it, everyone's talking sassy. We're all starting to sound very very same. It will like we did with Next Gen Firewall. We're all sounding very very similar. Uh, the key differentiators are the fact that most of the competition, I think all of the competition near enough, other than Fortinet, are, are proxies. And proxies inherently do things that can, that can complicate things. Um, See so many, many opportunities where I talk about proxying and allow lists and I go, oh, yeah, I allow this is getting longer and longer and longer, especially for something like 365 because they tell us don't do decryption don't do this because it breaks the application or we've got to open up so many ports and protocols it's just too hard we can just say well 365 do decryption look at the packet and uh, and, and away you go um, so a lot of advantages with us being a stream-based firewall over some of the competition um, differentiators we can talk to if that's important if you're, not, if you're thinking about making decisions on who you go with what about like existing firewalls um, within like local sites? Are they, do they need to be? As like, Palo Alto so, Networks right? ones or any ones? Well, currently we're predominantly Cisco firewalls, ASAs. So right, okay. would that cause issues within the architecture or would we need to, you know, change everything over? No, not at all. Like I said in that first slide, this one here, um, if you've got other firewalls that you're needing to use for this IP set connection into your data center, you might have ASAs in the DC as an example, because you need them there. Um, doesn't matter to us. We can connect into that Cisco ASA because to be honest, what you're doing is you're moving all the smarts off the Cisco ASA to the cloud. So you build an IP set tunnel and say, right, now I can do all my decryption. I can do all my UI filtering. I can do all my threat prevention up in the cloud. It hasn't been able to be done on the box anymore. So no, you, you don't have to rip and replace existing firewalls. Great. Super. Um, I, I think that's it. Thank you, Nick. It, that's, um, I think it's a really valuable overview.